I always like to start with this image. Um, it's an artwork by Ricardo Levens Morales. And I really like it because I think it symbolizes sort of my own research motivations. And in the background, you have a coffee field um, that is bare and growing on just soil. And in the foreground, you have a coffee field sort of uh, within an agroforestry system and a shade grown coffee. Um, and I think the contrast is stark when you start thinking about sort of the relationship between, between biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. So, um, yeah, so my name is Aida Guzman. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley um, in the Environmental Science uh, Policy and Management Department. Um, first of all, I'd love to acknowledge um, the different lab groups I'm part of, um, the Kremlin Lab, Bowles Lab, and Firestone Lab, which I think complement different aspects of the research I'm doing during my PhD, and also all the farmer participants who have kindly um, let me sample on their farms for the last couple of years. And, um, the many undergraduate and high school students who have helped me process samples in the lab and also collect uh, samples in the field, and of course the funding sources. So my sort of uh, big research question, I think, and what I sort of uh, think about is how do we make agricultural landscapes work both for the environment and for people? Um, and so um, what we can imagine is in this uh, uh, like sort of like uh, picturesque farm is that um, the bio biodiversity there is really going to impact what we see in terms of uh, the different functions in ecosystem services. So as we walk through it, um, the above ground diversity can reflect both the crop diversity over space and time, uh, floral strips or hedgerows, uh, livestock integration, um, insect communities including pollinators and beneficial insects. And the below ground diversity can include uh, a different uh, soil biota, including fungi, um, bacteria, insects, and worms, and much more. And this uh, then relates to the different ecosystem functions that we can observe in the system, including biological, geochemical, and other physical processes. And then these are also related to um, the ecosystem services we get from having biodiversity on these farms. Um, including pollination, food, um, erosion control, um, the control of pests or pathogens, nutrient cycling, and much more. And of course, these two different things in the ecosystem are highly dependent on biodiversity. In fact, one of the sort of the uh, running theories is sort of this relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem, ecosystem functioning. So in this figure, we see that as richness or diversity increases, we have higher ecosystem function, and the actual um, process or mechanism that happens is positive, but sometimes can waver in different directions. And so my research is in California, and it's in California Central Valley, which encompasses this 450 mile range. I'm sorry, I did not compare that to kilometers. Um, in the uh, very middle of, the, of California, which is surrounded by the two mountain ranges there. And so you might have never heard of this place, um, but you probably have heard of you know, the Bay Area, which I live in, um, or uh, Hollywood, or Yosemite, which is uh, gorgeous, or even the Redwoods um, it, that Claire Willing, if anybody stopped to her poster, um, researches. I actually look, I work on systems that are complete, completely different from what you imagine California to look like. Um, so this is sort of the Central Valley in California, and it's sort of the, um, an agricultural powerhouse. It kind of epitomizes industrial agriculture in the U.S. and it's been practiced in this sort of industrial agriculture for the last 100 years. Um, it actually produces 40% of all fruits and nuts consumed in California. And it produces uh, over 250 different crop types, sometimes up to 450, including almonds, oranges, strawberries, walnuts, kiwi fruit, figs, and much more. And it's actually sometimes the sole producer um, of these crops, uh, or the majority of these crops, um, it produces 90% of all strawberries, it produces uh, over 90% of all figs and dates uh, for the US. So it's a pretty, that's actually a date field. Um, so it's a pretty important agriculture region in the area. And as you drive down there, you see sort of these big um, plots of land that are um, um, obviously monoculture. Um, but through my research, something um, I'm also having grown up there is that within this landscape, um, what we've observed is that there's also other types of farms that exist that are embedded in this landscape. And in fact, um, here in the Central Valley, which is um, 
mapped out here, as we zoom in and drive closer into this landscape, what we actually find are these small scale diversified farms that are it's embedded in this monoculture system um, here in the landscape of the Central Valley. And so these farms actually look, um, you know, they're highly diverse, um, growing actually um, um, on less than uh, 25 acres or 10 he uh, hectares. Um, they're growing uh, 50 to 100 different crops. Um, and a lot of these farms have come in the last uh, uh, 10 to 20 years, and they're mostly farmed by immigrant and refugee farmers. Um, and so that's the timeline that we see. And so here you can see how they're just surrounded by all these monoculture uh, fields. And on these farms, like I said, they grow all these different types of crops that are phylogenetically and functionally uh, diverse, um, including ginger, uh, taro, peanuts, bitter melon, uh, kohlrabi, and many more. Um, many crops that I hadn't eaten myself and many crops that maybe you all have eaten or not eaten. And quite interesting, and there's about 2,000 farmers on just le less than 1% of the land in this landscape. So the other 99% of this land is monocultures, but uh, perhaps has a smaller share of the farmers that actually ex exist in this area. And yeah, on less than 1% of this land, um, we have about 2,000 farmers. And so uh, what a student and I did is just to, uh, I think a lot of people don't believe me about the amount of crop diversity that's on these farms. So we mapped them out row by row. So here's an example of some of the farms that we work on. Um, we have the monocultures, and then on uh, the right-hand side, we have the polycultures, and each color represents a different crop type. Um, so they're quite diverse, um, as you can see. So if we come back to um, this uh, sort of con uh, conceptual framework that I, I started with, um, we can then start thinking about sort of like what happens when we have um, decrease in biodiversity in the landscape, especially somewhere like the Central Valley where we may, may have had natural vegetation and as the diversity decreases, um, we have a decrease in ecosystem function. And the farms I work on, I actually started thinking about, about like what if you go the opposite direction? And so what happens when we increase above ground diversity, especially with these, all these crops on these, on these fields? Um, you know, and we're not talking about diversity like hedgerows and all these things, just the amount of different crops that are grown. And so I've been thinking about this just perhaps as we increase the number of, of different crop types on these fields, perhaps we have uh, an increase uh, below ground diversity of the soil community. And I'm very thankful that Maria Opik and also um, uh, Tom uh, spoke before me because um, one of the things I've been really fascinated about is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, uh, mostly because they're thought to be ubiquitous, but they also have um, a lot of a, a neat association with plants. And there's a strong relationship that, the, as the speakers have spoken on, that there's increase in plant diversity, there, uh, it's going to be increase in AMF diversity. And we've seen that a lot of natural systems, but I was curious if we basically take a farm that kind of has a huge amount of diversity um, um, that has come into industrial agriculture, do we see uh, an effect on the below ground community? Um, so like I said, I'm really glad they spoke before me because uh, I was going to introduce a um, AMF. Um, but just quickly, they form a symbiotic relationship with over 70% uh, of all vascular plants. In exchange for uh, photosynthetically fixed carbon, AMF transfers, uh, transfers nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And they originated 450 million years, and I think that's like a fascinating fact that like they've been around um, for very long in the first land plants that we have. And some of the uh, unique structures on, on these uh, fungi, which I think will be useful when, when I talk about some of the, uh, the data, is that they have these arbuscules, which um, are tree-like. Um, so I think like arbuscules in Latin is like tree, and they're sort of like the points of transfer for nutrients. Um, vesicles are sort of carbon storage, um, and hyphae is sort of the transportation system for the nutrients. And so before I move on in terms of talking about arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, in this research, I think we always try to think about, um, you know, what is the role of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in agriculture? And I think some would argue that perhaps um, it doesn't really matter for yields. Um, but then I think one thing that's really important to think about is that um, Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are important for an ecosystem much more than just plant productivity. And I really like this um, paper that came out and just thinking about how AM fungi are not just important for yield, but also important for system uh, performance and sustainability. So that's sort of like a driving motivation to look at AMF, not just for yield, but just look at how they could be just sort of biological indicators of ecosystem functioning and the ecosystem services we can have. So uh, following that, um, that 
uh, framework, um, arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi uh, have a potential to reduce the external inputs we bring into agriculture um, with some evidence on resistance to pathogens, tolerance to drought, uh, salt tolerance, and resistance to heavy metals, and also systemic and local resistance to pathogens. So um, to look at these questions in the field, um, uh, this is, I'm going to uh, go over the study design. Uh, so I worked about 31 uh, farms across uh, California Central Valley, and 16 of, those polyculture, 16 of those were polycultures and 15 were monocultures. Um, it's quite difficult to work with non-experimental farms, and um, it just anecdotally, I think I visited five times the number of farms that I actually sampled on to be able to uh, gather enough participants for this study. Um, also, the results I'll be showing uh, represent um, only about 50% of the data that I've collected. It's about 400 uh, soil samples across all these farms. Um, but you may or may not be wondering, like, how do you actually compare monoculture to polyculture? And so my study design um, looks at monocultures that are solely just growing um, eggplant um, and uh, polycultures that are growing at least two rows of eggplant. And what I sample on is um, this sort of perpendicular T-shaped on a polyculture where I have um, every farm is always sampled. Uh, the, there's like a focal block that's always going to be the same crop. And then perpendicular is a non-focal block. Um, this will be important for uh, uh, some of the data I present, um, so just keep that in mind. And then, um, yeah, across the farm, so that way I can both capture both what's happening with just one crop type, but also perhaps across the farm. And then I took uh, several samples uh, related to AMF. I took uh, root samples to look at colonization, and also soil samples to look at the AMF community composition. Um, one of the reasons why I separated those two samples out is that since I work on very small scale farms, taking a plant out of production is actually a really big deal for the farmers. And so I try to do as non-destructive sampling on these farms. So it means that I, uh, I can't get enough roots uh, to do all the samples for AMF. So I take some of the soil samples in the rhizosphere to look at AMF. Yeah, so, I'll, um, so the first piece of data that I've looked at um, is AMF colonization. And so what we find, um, so here's the focal and non-focal. Um, what's really interesting is that between the focal blocks, which is just eggplant, we find no difference. And actually, it matches the non-focal and the monocultures. What we do see an uptick is on the non-focal um, and the AMF condensation. But in general, there's not much difference between the farm types. And so um, looking at this, I was kind of confused because I, I expected um, so a much more of a bigger effect on polycultures on AMF colonization. So then I set it to uh, look at the structures um, of AMF. So this is based on like a, a good line metric of like this, um, does it have this structure or the other structure? And the same, we find usually no difference if like all the structures are present in that view with the slide. Um, it's the same with if there's arbuscules, we find no difference. Um, we also f uh, we find some effect of the vesicles that are present in the, in the roots. Um, and we find somewhat an effect of the, if there's a lot of hyphae. And so I started wondering, um, as some of the speakers right before me talked about, not all AMF are the same. And so um, what we see in the roots only tells you um, the structures that are inside the roots, but it doesn't really tell you about the community itself or how it's actually operating within the system. And so to look at the AMF community, to actually take a glimpse at um, at this, especially thinking about how um, biodiversity is really important for uh, providing functions, I was really curious, even if we don't find colonization, do we find a difference in the diversity of um, AMF that's there? And to do this, we took uh, soil samples, the rhizosphere soil samples, um, you know, uh, semi-standard uh, uh, like library prep from DNA extractions um, with ITS2, because some of the farmers wanted to know about pathogens. Um, and then uh, through uh, aluminum iSeq and then um, downstream on MTK and R. And so, yeah, which AMF are there? What we actually find is a distinct community between the polycultures and the monocultures. Um, and so that was sort of illuminating because although the, like I said, the colonization levels aren't different, there is um, a, a different community that we find in polycultures than the monocultures. And when we look at this in sort of like an abundance plot, you can uh, visually tell that um, the monocultures have uh, less taxa in them, and then um, on polycultures, we have more taxa. In general, I found the range uh, across all the samples uh, from two to 100 different taxa in each sample. So yeah, we find distinct AMF communities on these polycultures. So 
just quickly, um, I think this also looking at who's there is really important because not all AMF are the same. Um, I think uh, Tom brought up mutualism to parasitism. Uh, that's a really interesting framework to think about. Um, it's something I'm not measuring, but that these all AMF are functioning differently. Even if they're colonizing the roots, doesn't mean that they're actually providing a benefit to the plant. Another framework I've been thinking about is sort of the functional groups of, um, of these uh, fungi separate into the CSR theory, um, which takes sort of like, a, which are competitors, which are stress tolerant, ruderal. And it's not a perfect framework, but it does hurt help us sort of think about like the fact that they're not going to be the same. And in this paper they talk about how um, some of the uh, Aclospora are going to be the stress tolerant which we find in both systems, more so in monocultures, um, that the uh, Gigospora is going to be more competitive, um, we find both in the two systems, and that the ruderals like the um, rhizosphagus are going to be present. And so there's still much more work to be done and sort of trying to think about so why do we find different communities on these farms. So um, there can be other potential drivers of the AMF composition. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the different plants as an effect, um, which I hope to do in the future, but I'm showing you a picture just because, just to again illustrate the amount of diversity that exists on these farms. So we had jujube, Thai peppers, bitter melon is that uh, almost crazy looking fruit with the yellow and the red seeds. Um, and then we have lemongrass. Um, but it sort of illustrates that there might be other things happening. Um, I think like Maria explained, like there could be different like functional, uh, different plants, like plants that are perennial. So they, there's trees like the jujube that have been there for a couple of years. Um, but one thing that I am going to talk about is just soil pH, which is uh, sometimes thought about, about being a strong predictor for um, AMF. So first of all, um, I wonder if it pops up. OK, so the, I think the dots are too uh, light for them to pop up. You can see the mean and the standard. Well, basically, what we see is that there's no um, difference in the pH uh, between monoculture and polyculture. Um, but then I took this soil pH and uh, measured it against uh, sort of the different uh, diversity indices we can do with the data. And the first one, oh yeah, that sucks that the points aren't popping up. Uh, the first one is that we see that um, we don't see an interaction between farm type and pH, but we do see an effective pH as expected and also an effective farm type where uh, polyculture is having a higher, uh, a higher diversity than the monocultures. And the same applies for richness. There should have been a bunch of dots that they just think they like all disappear for some reason. Um, and then P if for richness is the same, um, we find an effective pH in both farm type um, with uh, uh, polycultures again having um, higher. For evenness, um, we find again an effect and actually the monocultures are more even than the um, polycultures with the polycultures uh, being less even. Um, this is basically telling you that the proportion of the different species are sort of all over the place on polycultures, and they're sort of uh, more similar in proportions. Of course, sequence data can only tell you so much about the abundance, so um, we should take that with a grain of salt. But um, what we do see is that um, there's a higher evenness on these farms. So the main takeaways um, from the work I've been doing, there's um, future work and future analyses uh, to be done. Um, but first, that there's a minimal difference in colonization, um, that there is differences in the AMF community composition between these two farm types, and that there's other potential like pH that may explain uh, patterns. And so, um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or comments, and thank you. Yeah.